test. One, two. Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to First Baptist Isle of Morada. We're so glad you guys chose to worship with us today. Um, So welcome. Uh, I think we have a pretty uh, standard week this week, uh, men's Bible study tomorrow night. Some great things happening with us on Tuesday during the community ministry. Um, We have a faith discussion group in the morning at 9. If you ever want to come and check that out, we'd love to have you. Uh, And then serving all day long. Our counseling service is in full swing. Uh, We now have five uh, individuals that are uh, in counseling, which is fantastic, trying to meet some of the core needs of the the folks in our community. So praise God for his provision there. Uh, And then Wednesday is ladies Bible study. So uh, come check us out. Uh, Either uh, stop by and ask me or talk to Pastor Brian. We'd be happy to hook you up. So uh, let's pray. Father, we... um, We're just so overwhelmed by how much you love us, Lord, and uh, we are so thankful today that that we're part of the same family, Lord, that you sent Jesus uh, to live and to die and sacrifice his life for us so that we could be in right relationship with you. So we thank you for that, Father. Uh, May the worship that we uh, offer to you today be pleasing. Uh, Father, thank you for everything that you have given us. Help us to be a light here in the Isla Mirada community. 
uh, proclaiming the name of Jesus. Uh, be with us today as we worship you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Craig is out this morning, so we're going to do music via YouTube. Deacon Jay is calling that up. If you want to stand, we will sing together.
scripture reading today is from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 to 17, 23, and 24. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. This is the word of God. Amen. Thank you, Angelo. You may be seated. Well, we've reached that time where we worship through giving, uh, and I just want to express my thanks to everybody that contributed to the, um, we're sending a container uh, to uh, Cuba uh, with uh, lots of different supplies, including bin building materials for churches, and uh, we raised $1,500 last week for that, so that's a praise. Thank you so much for that, and we're going to match that with 1500 from the church. So we'll be sending $3,000 to Alex so he can buy the things that's going to go on that container, and it'll be shipped uh, to Cuba here in just a couple of weeks. So thank you all for participating in that. Uh, this week, as I have kind of was preparing for our offering and thinking about uh, giving, I was just reminded just how good God has been to us. And I was drawn to um, a, a series of verses in Romans chapter 8, and I'd like to read them for you. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those wh whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Praise God. He is such a good God giving to us uh, with just, um, with no restraint. And uh, we're just so grateful. Uh, so this is a time that we can give back uh, in thanks to the Lord. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for caring for us, for loving us, for sending Jesus, Lord, for working all things together for our good. Uh, Father, help us to be generous in our giving. Lord, may this church in Nyla Murata be a light on a hill uh, that's proclaiming the gospel to those that don't know the Lord Jesus. Lord, help us in all that we do to bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a plate up here in the front, and there's also one in the back.
we have any children six and under desiring to go with Miss Carly across the parking lot to building two, also known as the fun building, if you're six or under, she will be happy to escort you that way. You're in good hands with Miss Carly. I always have a good time when I'm around her. Thank you for that. Well, now is the time, uh, first Sunday of the month, in addition to having the fellowship lunch after the service today, we always have the Lord's Supper on the first Sunday of the month, and um, with the COVID procedures, we're not passing the cups like we do, so you'll find a, a cup in the pew back in front of you, and it's tricky if you haven't done it before. There's a there's a clear layer on the top that I'm just going to pull back and expose the wafer. And then there's a silver layer that protects you from the grape, grape juice. Make sure that's pointing away from you because if it pops, sometimes it'll squirt on your white shirt. And uh, it's okay, I'm going to tilt that back. And now the puzzle is ready. All right. We practice an open communion at First Baptist Asylum Rada, meaning if you know Jesus as your Savior, you've trusted in Him and Him alone for your salvation, then you are welcome to partake with us. If you have children, we'll leave that up to the judgment of the parents as to uh, whether or not it would be appropriate for them to partake or not. If you need an extra one, I have some here. That uh, Brother Jay, raise your hand if uh, anybody needs one. Okay. Mm-hmm. You need a redo? Sometimes they don't work. See, that's why I do this at first, because the silver can be hard. <laughs> All right. Raise your hand, and uh, Jay will get you one if uh, you have trouble with it. Yeah. <laughs> See, we go through this early so that uh, we can pay attention when it gets to the serious part. The Lord's Supper is is a great opportunity. Another way in the worship service to present the gospel. We we think about the gospel in our prayers. We think about the gospel in our songs uh, as we sang at the cross. Uh, And now we think about the gospel with the Lord's Supper, the ordinance that Jesus himself instituted, whereby we consider the fact that his body was broken on our behalf. He was the physical sacrifice. And as the song said, his blood ran red and it washed us white. And so the atoning once and for all sacrifice of the Holy Lamb of God, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And so as believers, there's two aspects to this observance. On the one hand, we think about, okay, am I walking with the Lord? Is there any sin I need to confess and repent of and turn from? Is there something I'm doing I need to stop doing? Is there something I'm not doing I need to start doing? And we examine that and we pray through that silently in our own hearts. And then on the other side of that, there is this celebration that no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, the blood of Christ has washed you white as snow. And now, You are in the family of God, and what a great reward, what a great salvation. And so the Lord's Supper is most definitely a celebration. So let's just take some time to personally reflect. Um, Jay, you can play some background music, and then I'll come back. I'll read 1 Corinthians 11, and we'll take the Lord's Supper together.
ready to celebrate with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we remember you full of joy. The joy of the salvation you bring to us through Christ as we consider his body hanging on the cross at Calvary. You being satisfied with his sacrifice and the atoning work of his holy and precious blood washing us white as snow. We rejoice in the gospel. We thank you that you have redeemed us. God is your people. We are here to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray now as we go into the preaching of your word that you would, by your spirit, give us ears to hear and eyes to see. That you would cause the word of God to bring life, to bring sanctification, to bring encouragement in the most holy faith that we as a body would be changed to be more like Jesus, to be better equipped to go from this place of worship out into the world where you have called us to be ambassadors for Christ. Put a smile of joy on our face that others may see you in us. Give us a love for them just as you have loved us. Bring people to yourself for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29, we will be going 30 verses today. I know you probably don't believe that I have the ability to go through 30 verses. When I told Craig, he sent back a laughing emoji. Uh, I got through one verse in Sunday school this morning, so this will be a challenge. I've entitled it, Jacob's Joining Journey. I subtitled it, The Everyday Life of One of Your Brothers and His Ups and Downs. I've been fascinating reading through the patriarchs, those that God chose in the very beginning, to see, even though they're on this pedestal, they're held up, um, having interactions face to face with God, yet they are so like us. And their lives are so like our lives. And so as I, as I saw Jacob's journey, I just thought about the journey that we're on. A journey is simply traveling to some place over some amount of time for some distance. So anything really could be considered a journey there's all kinds of journeys sometimes i dread the journey of simply going to the grocery store what a journey that can be sometimes we here on the island journey all the way to the mainland to find a bigger civilization but sometimes the mainland can be like a foreign land and when you travel overseas to a foreign land, that can be a difficult journey because you find people, they may look a little different than you do. They may speak a different language than you speak. Their culture and their customs may be unfamiliar to you. You may get in trouble simply for waving at someone with the wrong hand. And you're, why are they so upset? I don't understand what's going on here. 
journeys can take us many places. We can go many ways. We can go by foot. We can go by bike, car, train, plane, boat. And I guess if you have enough money now, you can get on some sort of rocket ship. <laughs> uh, so all kinds of ways to go on a journey, all kinds of differences. But then soberly thinking in the news, I think last night when I looked, the latest UN estimate is 1.2 million Ukrainian refugees on a journey to where? Why? Being forced from their homes on the road, wondering, you know, what, what do you take with you? Where do you go? What, what are you going to find? What lies ahead of you on this journey? Well, by way of review, remember Jacob deceived his father Isaac for the blessing back in chapter 27 of Genesis. As a result, his brother Esau was pretty upset such that he planned to kill him over the deal. And so, Rebecca and Isaac said, it's probably best that we send, um, that we send Jacob away because his brother's going to kill him otherwise. And so, paternal command, Isaac sends Jacob back to Haran, some 400 miles to the northeast, where his mother Rebecca came from. And he says, go and, and find yourself a wife there. Meanwhile, the rebellious brother Esau takes another pagan wife. For, he's up to three now. Wives um, in rebellion against his parents because his parents are insistent that God's people marry within God's people. And so Esau, as a rebellious young man, is doing everything he can to upset them. And then last week, Jacob got some 50 miles into his 400-mile journey when he had a dream. And it was a great dream, a, a redeeming encounter with the living God, whereby God passes on his promises that he first made to Abraham, now to Jacob. And so we often read in the scriptures about your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those three patriarchs. And so with this gospel encounter, I'm going to call it, his dream last week. He is energized with hope, and now he is moving out in chapter 29 to complete this journey that he is on. And I wonder what's going on in his mind as he thinks, boy, this didn't work out so well. You know, I, I plan to get the blessing. I, I kind of went about it the very wrong way and now I'm suffering consequences and I find myself on foot uh, on a long journey kind of as an exile probably feeling bad and I say probably why because Jacob is redeemed and if you're redeemed and you sin then the Holy Spirit is going to convict you of your sins so I know he was feeling bad as he headed to Bethel but at Bethel energized by the hope of the promise God assuring him of his covenant he sets out in chapter 29. So let's read together. I'm going to read all 30 verses. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large, and when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where do you come from? They said, We are from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, We know him. He said to them, Is it well with him? They said, it is well. And see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. He said, behold, it is still high day. It's not time for livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go, pasture them. But they said, we cannot, 
until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well, then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and served Laban for another seven years. Father, as we contemplate this journey that you sent Jacob on, may you by your spirit help us to see how these things relate to the journey that you have sent us on. Help us to take the principles from the patriarch Jacob, from one of our brothers in the faith. and Help us to learn lessons that we might live a life that brings you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first four verses, point number one, the journey. Jacob went on the journey and he came to the land of the people of the east. I am sure that uh, he was weary by this time. Um, I am sure that he was wondering how it would all turn out going to this place. As we spoke of before, I am sure that he regretted having put himself in a position to be exiled and sent out away from the family. But as we think about the dream, I'm reminded of the gospel. And in chapter 28, verse 17, after his encounter with God, it says he was afraid. You know, it's a good thing to be in a sense of awe. To fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And to be convicted of one's sin and, and our unholiness and unrighteousness in his presence is healthy and it leads to confession of sin just like we talked about in the Lord's Supper and so I'm reminded of 1 John 1 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness I think last week's encounter with God set Jacob out on this journey with renewed strength, having been forgiven of his past and reassured that God still loved him. A picture of his unconditional love for his people. No matter how many times they slip and fail, 
God's forgiveness is unending. And now we are getting into a story that I think represents full well the truth of Romans 8.28, which you remember says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. You're wondering as your hot, sweaty, dusty road, walking 400 miles, how is this going to work together for good? I'm sure there are days of doubt on that travel. But the scripture says, God is working all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And so last week in 2821, we see God honoring faith when Jacob says, the Lord shall be my God. The Lord shall be my God. You only say that through faith in God. And we should be walking on this journey with that in mind. And in fact, as you think about it, that is all that Jacob the patriarch had at this point. He left with nothing. He left broken. He left guilty. And now he's been reminded of the covenant that God has made to be his God and to save him. And so Jacob has God himself. And it reminded me of his grandfather, Abraham. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, when God said to his grandfather Abraham in the New King James Version, he said, I am your great reward. Of all the things that God promises, the fact that he would love us and that he would be our great reward, well, that is all that we need. On this journey, I remember the cliche, the more stuff you have, the more stuff owns you, or it, the more it has you. <laughs> so true. But I think about Jacob, and just he, he has the Lord, and the Lord is his great reward. We were in Waco, Texas uh, a couple weeks ago, and Pastor John Durbin was preaching on, Durham was preaching on heaven. And his text was John chapter 14. And I got distracted flipping through as I read verse 3 of chapter 14 of John. It says, Jesus is saying to his disciples, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And I just sat there and I thought, why is Jesus doing this? Well, he's going to prepare a place. Yeah, but why is he going there to prepare a place for you? So that where he is, we may be also. And I thought that is the same thing that God was communicating to Abraham in the very beginning. The truth that I need to let set in my mind is that God is my great reward. God is my great reward treasure and if that is true then these journeys that we're on well they become much easier to endure the dusty road or the long miles or the differences with the people we interact with because the destination is is not my goal the object is not my goal i have my great reward in the Savior himself. And so, by way of application, when all you have is God, it's easy to go. <laughs> I have a friend who's a minimalist, and he can pick up and go pretty much whenever he wants to. It's easy. The less stuff you have, the less you worry about it. And when God says, Hey, I want to use you to be my ambassador over here. And you don't look and say, well, I got this big house over here, and I got this second house over here, and I got this large boat, and the small boat, and the smaller boat, and the even smaller boat. I have had four boats one time. I mean, none of them were in great shape, but they all have a different purpose. You know, they're like shoes for ladies. You can never have too many. Uh, but we don't have any. You're not worried about what you're going to do with them. You know, should I sell them? 
and put them on Facebook Marketplace or should I just give them away? I, I could just go. All I have is the Lord. Wherever he leads me, I will follow. You know, in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8, after Ezra the prophet has, has read the word of God to the people, giving them the sense of the meaning, then Nehemiah, the, government, uh, the governor, says and tells the people, do not be grieved, because they, they had just been exposed to the word of God and they were convicted of their sin, and that's a good response. But he says, do not be grieved, but rather go for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And again, I think this is related to the fact that God is your great reward. And if God is your great reward, then the joy of your salvation, the joy of his salvation is what energizes you, is what motivates you, is what causes you to persevere on the long, dusty road of your journey. And so, search for God. He can be found in His Word. And as you read His Word, you learn about Him. And as you learn about Him, you grow to treasure and love Him. And as you treasure and love Him, then you are strengthened and filled with joy. So, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you discouraged on this journey that God is calling you on? Focus on the joy of the Lord. Well, how do I do that practically? Well, if you listen to music, you can listen to music that is theologically accurate and spiritually uplifting, that has words that communicate the truth of the gospel to your heart and mind. So that when you're out on the boat and you have the last tune going through your mind, it's not some secular trash, but some uplifting truth from God's word. You can be careful about what you put into your eyes and ears on the TV. You may even choose to not watch the TV and, and read the scriptures or read uh, a Christian book. You, by way of practice, how do I have the joy of the Lord, can be careful who you hang out with. Your friends will influence how you think and what you do. The scripture says that. So if you are hanging out with people who are full of the joy of the Lord, then you will probably be strengthened by them. And prepare to interact with the other people in your life so that you can be a light to them and share the hope instead of being just as depressed and angry as they are because all you're consuming is the daily news. You can be careful what establishments you go to. There are all kinds of practical ways to focus on being filled with the joy of the Lord. And they're available to all of us. And, and maybe they don't seem as appealing, but we're reading the scriptures and we're seeing that interacting with God is what energizes us on what inevitably is a difficult journey that God is calling you on. I know you're on a difficult journey because you're still here. You're God's child and you're not in heaven. And I know the scriptures say this is not your home. You're not being fulfilled here. Your longing is to be with God, your Father, in a place where there's no more sorrow, no more tears. But yet you're still here. You're here on this earth, and it's hot, and you get sweaty, and the people are usually not nice to you. But that's okay, because you have the treasure of the gospel, and God is leaving you here to be his ambassadors, to be the one person smiling so that they say, why in the world are you smiling? And you say, because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yes, I'm in the same circumstances, but you know what? I'm kind of seeing through those circumstances, and I'm seeing eternity. And I know that God's working all these things together for good. No, I wouldn't describe this as a great situation with the flat tire and all that, but I know the truth, and the truth is God's using this flat tire for some good purpose, for his glory and my sanctification. So I'm on this journey, and it's powered by the joy of the Lord. Well, in these first four verses, he's made it to Haran, Mesopotamia, beyond the Euphrates, the 400-mile journey from Beersheba. And without a GPS, he ends up at the right well at the right time. That is amazing. 
I can't even hardly get to church without my GPS, and there's only one road between here and my house. But, but Jacob is here at this well, uh, and he sees the shepherds and the well and the stone, and he says, my brothers, where'd you come from? And they said, we're here from Haran. Well, that's where Dad sent me. So apparently the instructions he gave were pretty accurate. And uh, fascinating to me that you can do that, walk by foot somewhere like that, 400 miles. But then I thought, well, providence versus coincidence, right? He didn't just end up at this well coincidentally. That's a secular pagan term that gives credit to circumstance. Providence is a biblical term that gives credit Credit, uh, credit to God and Him leading you in paths of righteousness for His name's sake and bringing you to the right well at the right time. The psalmist says in chapter 37, verse 23, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Hmm. That is a great qu- clarifier, isn't it? I can't just walk out here and demand that God's going to bless my steps and lead me to the right well at the right time. He said, no, he does that for his children when they delight in his ways. So Jacob has come off this dream and he has declared, the Lord shall be my God, I'm going to serve God. He's got his mind right now, walking in paths of righteousness, determined to do the right thing because God says so. He's on the journey. We're on a journey. May the joy of the Lord be our strength and may providence guide us where we need to be next. But right now, next is number two, joy. In verses 5 through 14, we see this celebration as Jacob gets the details of, yep, 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 yep. All these affirmations of, you've, you've found your family, brother Jacob. We are the people you're looking for. And in fact... Here comes his daughter, Rachel, and uh, he is pretty excited to see her. After all these miles, and I don't know how long time it took him to get there, but he's met the family, and remember, he was supposed to find a wife, and (laughs) the first one he comes into contact with, it appears to me like love is first sight. He kisses her, starts crying over it. I mean, that's exactly how I felt when I saw Heather. (laughs) Just, I mean, she wasn't paying attention to me at the time. Took a full six months before she greeted me back. Uh, But anyway, that's not the case here. Uh, Jacob meets Rachel, and it is wonderful. And you see how Jacob serves he he rolls the stone back he waters the livestock she gets the news and the briefing from him and runs to her father she she drops what she's doing she prioritizes this kinsman her father's nephew Jacob and so i see that Love produces action. I, I'm reminded of John 13, 35, when Jesus said, By this, all people will know that you're my disciples. If you have love for one another. You see, the way of the world is to treat others poorly and to treat yourself as best you can. And to get everything for yourself. Jacob didn't wait for Rachel to water her sheep. He did the heavy lifting. He did the serving. Uh, Rachel didn't take the news nonchalantly that was apparently super important, making this guy cry about this reunion. She ran back to dad. She didn't wait till her business was done, and she didn't walk. She prioritized him and his mission, in effect, loving him. And then even Laban, his uncle, when he gets the news, he runs. This is an older fellow running to meet the younger man. Now, what we know about Laban, he could have had some some mixed motives. 
Um, we can talk about that in a little bit. Well, let's talk about it right now. You remember the last time Laban met somebody in Abraham's household? It was Abraham's servant. Abraham sent him to Haran to find a wife for Isaac. And what did Abraham send his servant with? A bunch of stuff. Lots of wealth saying, hey, my servant's coming to get a wife for my son, and it's going to be worth her time. And uh, Laban took advantage of all those things and received it. And so I imagine when Rebecca tells her dad, hey, you know, the same same fella who um, came and took your sister, Rebecca, well, his grandson is here. I bet he thought, oh, yay. Gimme, gimme, gimme. I love this guy. And so he runs out there. and uh, But then he finds Jacob. And does Jacob have any wealth with him? No, he doesn't. So, hmm, how is Laban going to respond? Well, he responds well. He brought him in. And, and Jacob told all these things to Laban, it says in verse 13. So I figure he's kind of having to explain why I'm part of the patriarchal family, yet my hands are empty. He's got to give him the backstory. And Laban responds well and says, with an exclamation point, surely you are my bone and my flesh, and stay with me. He stays with him for a month, so hospitality. So joy as we're reunited with kinsmen, and as we think about application for us, we see some good examples here, I think, of loving one another, and they're described by actions. Watering sheep, running, hospitality. And so on our journeys, whatever journeys we're on, may we love one another well. I think it's very clear in the New Testament that we are to prioritize our brothers and sisters in Christ to love them first and foremost and to go out of our way to minister to God's children. What does that look like? Well, I've already spoke to one person this morning for the fellowship lunch this afternoon. It looks like one of the best Cuban pork dishes you've ever had. So if I were you, I would race over there uh, because it's delicious. Uh, But that's one simple way of loving your brothers and sisters. You know, every first Sunday of the month, we're going to have lunch together. So that world-famous banana pudding you make, make it next month, first Sunday. You will be loving us well. It looks like, hey, my brother is uh, got some wonderful music he wants you to listen to. So let me share this wonderful music with you. It looks like uh, my brother, is, is his sister, they're moving. Well... How about I lend a hand and help you do it and move? There's all kinds of just simple, everyday, practical ways of you having more fish than you can hold in your freezer and sharing it with one of your brothers. Anyway, you get the idea. There's so many opportunities for me to love you. I need to take advantage of more of them. We need to take more advantage of loving one another and so have a testimony in our community. Point number three, we see the job. In verses 15 through 20, we spoke and said um, that Jacob didn't come with anything. And Laban, I think, is, is doing well by saying, you're here, you're staying with me, you're serving me, but it's not right that you serve me for nothing. Uh, so that's good. And he says, uh, what, what shall your wages be? Um, well, that'd be great if every boss... He asked you, hey, what do you want me what do you want me to pay you for this deal? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, now remind me, work in general. Uh, did work come uh, before or after the fall? Did I hear somebody say before? Because remember, God told him to work the garden. Yeah, and that's important because now we can declare that work is good. 
I'm tempted to think work is bad, but I know it's good because it was there before the fall, and everything was good. So work is good uh, and good for us. And Jacob is willing to work. He's working. In fact, he's working for nothing. He's, he's running on emotion this first month. He's just so excited to have reached his des- the destination of his journey and having met Rachel and love at first sight. Um, he's kind of excited. But he came there with, with nothing, with no wealth. And so maybe this explains his offer to work for Rachel as his wages because he loved her and said i'll serve you seven years you know normally it's the custom that the man's family brings a dowry to present to the bride's parents you can think of it in a way of they're losing a great asset from the family and so this dowry is to in some way help cover that loss seven years Working, what what a great example of for us in a drive through era to see patience. I will work seven long years if I could just marry Rachel. Wow. And the the principle of working hard for something important. Hmm. This is good. And Laban agrees to the barter. And that, I don't know, for me personally, doesn't sit well. (laughs) I would think, huh, this is my future son-in-law. We should work something else out. You know, I I want to bless you. You're going to be in the family. And I don't know how Rachel felt about being bartered over for a certain number of years of work. I don't know. I have several questions about that, but but I don't know what to think. So I'm going to let you figure that out. But I know this, in in verse 20, Jacob experienced some sort of time lapse fueled by love. (laughs) Isn't that great? So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. I don't know about you, seven years, does that seem like a few days to you? Like a few days ago was 2015. Is that how you feel? It feels like a really long time ago, 2015. I mean, do you even remember what you were doing in 2015? I didn't live here. I live in Panama City. My oldest son was just graduating from high school, I think. Yeah, that was a long time ago. I I can barely remember. But for Jacob, it just was like a few days because... He was just so motivated by love and his heart was filled with joy. He had God on his side. He was sent on a place that he had found. He was sent to find a wife from his mom's family. He found her. I mean, he's just doing great. Life is wonderful. But as I think about a job and I think about work and I I bring myself back to to our reality and think, okay, what am I? What am I going to take from this in terms of working? And I love Colossians 3. That's why I had uh, Brother Angela read that this morning. Verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily. That is a lesson that, that we need to get back out in our culture. We need to raise young people to work heartily. We need to work heartily ourselves. How? As for the Lord... And not for men. Ah. He so knew what he was talking about when he put that in there because we're so inclined to focus on pleasing the people around us. And certainly, if your boss is the one you're dependent upon giving the paycheck, then that makes sense. I get it. But he says, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. Boy, that seems to be a theme for us. The inheritance we get from the Lord is our reward. You are serving the Christ. So, even in our jobs, even in tending the garden, changing a tire, catching a fish, trading a stock, 
We're working for the Lord. The New Testament characterizes us as slaves to Christ, servants of Christ, ambassadors for Christ. We are in God's family in Christ Jesus. We're not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, which is his. So everything we do this side of heaven is to be done for him. And when you're working for God, you do the job right. You work hard. You work heartily. You work with everything you have and you do it as well as you can because it is for God. So on our journeys, whatever our job, let us work heartily as unto the Lord. Seeing through our boss as a mere representative, but really wanting to please God who sees us in all places, in all times. Our boss doesn't see us when he goes around the corner and we may be tempted to slack off, but the Lord wants me to work hard even when the boss is not looking. So, practically speaking, what does that look like to work as unto the Lord, to apply this principle that we see our patriarch Jacob doing in Genesis 29? Well, we can be on time. We can complete the tasks that we've been given. We can use the spell checker. It's not that hard before you send something out. Send it out with the words spelled correctly. And you know what? You also have to read it because you can put a word in that's spelled correctly and it doesn't make sense if you just would read the sentence. So read it before you send it. That helps. And it presents a good job. You can be nice to people. You can go above and beyond what you have been asked to do. You can make it look even better than the minimum standard that was given. What it doesn't look like is you don't cheat. You don't steal. You don't take one of your boss's stacks of sticky notes. You don't take his boxes of pens at work and use them at home. That's what working heartily as unto the Lord can look like on an everyday basis as you live out the gospel. Last point, as we get to verses 21 through 30, we see the joining, the marriage that takes place. And this is, you know, another crazy part, isn't it? I don't understand several of these details, like how he doesn't know until the morning that it's Leah. You can help me understand that after the service, maybe. But when he does figure it out, he's upset, isn't he? Because he was deceived. It was deception. He was defrauded. He worked for seven years for an agreed-upon contract, and it wasn't fulfilled. So you understand why he's upset, don't you? But, What's ironic about Jacob being deceived? Why was he exiled? Why was he sent on this journey? Because of his deception. It's so funny how quickly I am tempted to be slightly emotionally aroused when someone cuts in front of me on US-1. But yet, when I'm in a hurry and I just... There wasn't even two inches there, but all I need is an inch. I'm just going to slide in right here. It doesn't bother me a bit. When I'm trying to get what I want to get, it seems like it's fine. But when somebody else does it to me, how obvious and egregious. Oh, you're just thinking about yourself. This is not the right thing to do. How could you? I tell you how you can. You can just be an imperfect human this side of heaven. And don't even think about anything. And you will just do what is in your own self-interest. It's hard to live for Jesus. It's hard to walk by the Spirit. It's hard to apply all these concepts day in and day out, faithfully doing the right thing. And so, when you see people deceive you, defraud you, cheat you... Just be empathetic. Know that that was you. That was me. And sometimes it still can be us. But God 
He's been gracious to us in Christ Jesus and forgiven us. He is our great reward. We have been saved from ourselves. And so we pray this person would be saved from themselves. That they would have an interaction with the God of all grace. You know, interestingly, Laban tries to rationalize the deal by saying, well, you know, it's not our custom, it's not our practice. A, that would have been helpful to know in the, in the signing of the contract. Um, B, you know, too often we rationalize and justify our actions with something other than, thus saith the Lord. I don't really care what the custom or courtesy is. If it goes against God's word, we're not going to do it. That's what Peter and John told them, right? When they said, hey, you need to stop preaching about Jesus. They said, oh, well, you judge whether we do what God says or what you do, what you say we do. We always have to do what God says we have to do. And, you know, just like we don't get into the sacrificial system till later in the scriptures, we saw back Cain and Abel offering sacrifice. How did they know? How was one right and one was wrong? How did they know what was right and wrong? I think God told them. I think they knew. And so I think these people knew what is later said in Leviticus 18, 18. And you shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister, uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. It's just not a good idea to marry two sisters. Why would you do that? Not a godly reason. And so I, th- I think... Laban, the deceiver, knows this. I think he's just not doing the right thing. I mean, the scripture says the two shall become one, not the three shall become one. That's a mathematical, biblical rule. So, back to my reality. The Old Testament here, it just shows man's sinful, fallen state, even back to the redeemed patriarchs. Sin corrupts, causes us to do things against God's will and God's word. You see their family's humanity, and it's fascinating even as we read about Jacob loving Rachel more than Leah, and I feel bad for Leah. I feel bad for all kinds of people because we do that, don't we? We love some people more than others in our imperfect humanity. That's what we do, but Let's bring back the good news of the gospel. It's not so with God. Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Aren't you thankful for that? It doesn't matter if you have no job or you're the CEO of the biggest company on the planet. That doesn't make a difference to God. It doesn't matter if you're short, tall, skinny or wide, white or black, smart or not as smart. God shows no partiality. Peter said, but in every nation, anyone who fears him, we talked about that already today, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now, I know the gospel says we're saved by faith. We're not saved by works. But I'm assuming you're on the other side of salvation and you're living for Jesus. And guess what? Ephesians 2.10 says you are to walk in good works that God has prepared for you to walk in. We are to live right. We are to do right. We are to be full of integrity. We are to be the hardest, best workers. So notice the connection between belief and action. Men and women, boys and girls of faith, act differently. Always do the right thing and walk in the blessings of God in whatever journey you're on. Don't rationalize and say, well, my journey's harder than their journey, so surely God will understand if I make this shortcut. No, he won't. He expects you to do the right thing all the time. And so as I read through these 30 verses, I just found myself saying, where is God in all this? It gets so sideways and convoluted and and messy. But he's there. You know, I didn't see how we were going to recover from Rebecca and Jacob's deception. But then 
Jacob has this dream and God says, you know, it's a good thing. It doesn't depend upon you. My covenant promises for salvation. And he just squares it back away, leads him where he needs to be led. And then he's there and things get sideways and messy with sin and men doing what they think is right. But God, he's a God of reconciliation. He's a God of redemption. He has a way of working all things together for your good, child of God. So wherever you're at, whatever journey you're on, I know it's hard, but I know God is leading you. And we are to look to Him and have the joy of the Lord be our strength as we journey just like our brother Jacob. Father, we are thankful for the encouragement we find even in the Old Testament patriarchs living lives so very similar to our own hard difficult circumstances being deceived defrauded cheating failing you but you're full of grace and mercy and that is the gospel that is the treasure that we have in these jars of clay we pray that you would help us to understand our salvation that we might be filled with joy and that that joy might energize us to go from this place to be a light into the world to share with people that you love them in Christ Jesus we pray that you would draw them to yourself that you would be glorified in us and in them that your will would be done give us strength on this journey we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to join us in Building 2 for fellowship afterwards. Thank you so much for being here, especially those of you on vacation, limited days down here, and you chose to be here in the house of the Lord to worship with us. Thank you. Your faithfulness encourages us. Go and have a blessed week in the name of Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed.